I have a friend. His name is JJ. Well, actually, his name is Jogindra Singh Johal, but he goes by JJ. You may have met him. He runs a couple of the mini-marts in the area. But God brought him to live next to us a couple of years ago. And JJ is a Punjabi from India, and he belongs to a religion. They say Sikh. We say Sikh because you don't want to say somebody's Sikh. That doesn't sound quite right. And he is an adherent to an ancient Indian religion called Sikhism. And over the time they lived next to us, we developed a great friendship. And uh, we got to eat some amazing Indian food. One thing I learned about Sikhs is feeding other people is part of their religion. Uh, they have a golden temple in India that is covered literally with gold, 24 karat gold. And they feed sometimes at the peak up to 10,000 people a day there. Anybody can just come through, get all the food they want. And obviously in India, that can be a big deal. And every time I would try to say to him, thank you for the tea, or, and you know Indian people laugh when you say chai tea. You know chai means tea, right? So it's like, can I have some tea tea? So we'd have amazing chai at their house and wonderful meals. And I'd say, thank you. And they'd say, oh, no, no, this is for God. And Sikhs believe in one God, and ironically, there were many interesting experiences. He told me a lot about the religion. He was very interested in sharing that. Uh, he has a friend who is a Christian, and so he already knew quite a bit about Christianity, and we shared about those things. And I learned a lot about not only their core of their religion, but of their history in India. And there are certain signs that all Sikhs have. And once you start seeing them, you will understand a little thing that's important. Number one, many of them have really long hair and wear the turbans. That's a sign of a devoted Sikh. And they get confused with the Muslims over here, which is really sad because actually the Muslims have been killing them in India for hundreds of years. So they are often truck drivers or run a lot of the, the uh, little mini-mart shops. And they wear a steel bracelet around their wrist. Every Sikh has that. They also have a comb in their hair. They have a dagger on them. And they have long beards if they're men. Those are the signs of being Sikh. And I learned how to connect to them and relate to them. And actually, we went to some of their celebrations. And you know, there is a hope in me at some point that I can represent Jesus to him. And it was very, very interesting because in their religion, they... they honor a lot of other religious people and religions. They honor Jesus as well as other prophets. They would see them. And so when his baby was sick, his grandson was sick, he asked me if I would come over and pray with the family. And so I came over and I prayed in the name of Jesus and I prayed for them. And they were very grateful because in their understanding, that is an acceptable, we're all talking to the same God. And so I have this experience, and I, and I want to say not only what happened with JJ, but what's happening inside of me. Because as a kid, I grew up in small towns where everybody looked pretty much the same, and whenever I went to a big city, it was like, oh, this diversity, this bewildering, overwhelming, too many kinds of people and too many kinds of lifestyles and beliefs, and it all seemed overwhelming. I couldn't wait to get back to wherever that core was. And you know, you realize as God develops you that Everybody that he's created is created in his image, and they are valuable and wonderful. And I would say I'm actually on the opposite side of the scale now. I kind of seek out people that speak a different language or look differently or believe differently. And JJ and I had very respectable dialogues, even though our worldviews are completely different. And as I answer the question, if we talk about how do we know that Christianity is the true religion? How do we know that we've got it right and for me, growing up, the question was, you know, I've been well indoctrinated in the Christian system. I know the answers from this point of view. If I were raised in a Hindu home, wouldn't I know those answers? If I were raised in an, a home that believed in Islam, would I not believe and say the same things? If I were raised in a village in Cambodia where they sacrificed to the spirits, would I not believe that? So the question is not, have you been well enculturated? The question is, are there earmarks about following Jesus that say, this is the truth, not just another organized system of belief? And so I would challenge you as we walk through and say, is this the true religion? And I, and I want that to 
both give you an ability to say, I'm more confident in my belief, and I will point out some of the holes and some of the other thinking, but my, my goal is not to give you some ammunition to argue, because believe me, nobody ever gets argued into the kingdom of God. And sometimes you win an argument and lose a soul. Sometimes you're not interested in the person, you're interested in winning the argument. So I want us to have some good information, but I also want us to have more than that. I want us to have a heart to be Jesus to people who were caught in the trap of some other kind of system of seeing the world and belief. That we do so not with snarkiness, but with compassion and with care. And I also want to ask you a question. What faith system do you think is the greatest threat to people at Family Church? You think about that. We'll come back to that at the end. We're going to talk about religion, examining religion and those key questions. And it's pretty obvious that people are religious. You know that, according to Google, there are 4,200 different religions in the world. And that's part of it as you start reading the history of religions and Every major religion has all kinds of splinters and difficulties and groups that came out. And all the way through human history, there have been people that have stood up and said, I got a vision. I got a message from God. I had an angel appear to me. I got this word from God. And they would create a following. They would write books or whatever that looked like. So there is no end to the fountain of religion. And I think there's a couple of reasons people are religious. Number one, the world is a confusing place and we need to make sense of all the big questions. Everybody's got to answer, what is life about? Is there life after death? Is there a God? Where did we come from? And listen carefully, any answers to those questions is a religious answer. Because you've got to answer the big questions some way. So that's why there are lots of answers or lots of thoughts on those. Secondly, I think people are religious because... At the core of it, we are very weak and we need help. You get to places, people say even atheists pray in foxholes, you know. There are places in your life where we need help. And I remember hearing a young man who had no religious affiliation and he said, I needed this so I, I asked the universe if they would do it. <laughs> like you just spit it out there to the stars in space. And he, he seemed to think that if he just expressed his needs to the universe, that the universe would somehow cooperate. I found the universe to be highly uncooperative. I don't know how about you, but, but there is this need for, for help. And so we come. And I remember somebody that came to church and they said, you know, Paul, I'm embarrassed. I've heard about God all my life and I ignored him as long as things were going well. And then I had a crisis. And now here I've come and I've finally come to kneel and to surrender to God. And I said, welcome to the club. <laughs> that's, that's how most people get here because... That's often what brings us around. And then thirdly, at the core of all this, I believe it's because God has created us and he's given us a soul and we are created to worship. And if you do not worship the true God and listen to him, you will worship something or someone else because that's how we are created. We have a spirit that in us looks for meaning and purpose and looks for something to worship. So let's look a little bit about just the religious landscape. There are supposedly, reportedly, 2.1 billion people who would call themselves Christian. And of course, this includes Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, people who don't believe the Bible's true, people that just grew up in a Christian country. It includes anybody that would say, I am a Christian. And close behind that, 1.3 billion would identify with the religion called Islam. They're Muslims. And that religious movement is growing around the world, partly by force and partly because Part of the lifestyle of the, Mormon, or of the Muslim people is that they have lots and lots of children. I read an article where the, the native French people are having children, their birth rate is somewhere about 1.6 or 7, and the Muslims who've come in from the outside who are now 10% of the country, they have a birth rate somewhere over 4. So what's going to happen in two generations? You can see pretty quickly that France is going to have a Muslim majority, and and there are lots of places where that's happening. So the, the religious landscape changes pretty often as it, as it continues to change. And then there are huge numbers of people who 
would aspire to some kind of an Eastern religion, some kind of meditation, and this has actually made great inroads in the American public where you just sit and calm yourself and think of nothing and have this kind of open yourself to the spiritual life. And in fact, I think there's a lot of emphasis that I'm hearing, and people say, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. And generally what they mean is, I don't want to be part of organized religion. And I thought, if you knew how disorganized it was, you might change your idea about that. But, but this idea that I don't want to be part of any system, I just want to be spiritual. And of course, people mean all kinds of things by that. What I was interested in is, the third largest category are people that say, you got it all if you got it wrong. They would call themselves secular or agnostic or atheistic or perhaps just... Uh, non-religious. But their stance, and that's the third largest group in our world today of people who say, I don't think there is anything worth worshiping. And then, of course, in our culture, there is tremendous pressure, and it often is focused around this idea of coexistence. Now, when JJ and I sat and talked about our differing worldviews and differing religious views, we have not only a civil conversation, we actually have, we're friends. But the underlying feeling about this idea of coexist really says tolerance is not just being kind to people who disagree with you. It's that you can never say anybody is wrong. Nothing is wrong and nobody is wrong. Now, excuse me, when you can give trophies to every team on the Little League field and say you're the winner, but the problem with this religious questions is that the answers are not compatible. So as we examine religion, let let me just bring you to some things that I think are part of our core understanding of it. The Bible, again and again, refers to this idea that worship is not only a process of giving our will and surrendering our life, it's, it's also a process of transforming us. You become like what we worship. Now, Behind that, you realize that the biblical picture of the world is that not only is there a God in heaven and he is the creator and the ruler, but there is also Satan and evil spirits. And when we think of the work of Satan, we often think of he tries to get people to murder and to get drunk and illicit sexuality or something. We we think of the dark side. Do you realize that half of Satan's work is in religion? That he's called the angel of light. And that, in fact, all of these people who are coming up with the worship of idols, and in the people group that we've adopted in Cambodia, every village has a little banana grove in the center, and that's where the spirits live. And the children are taught from an early age, you never go near that, you never go around that, and they they do sacrifices to appease the spirits. And their, their whole religious life is to keep the spirits from being angry. And you think to yourself, how could people do that? What? Why would they believe in such crazy stuff? Because there really are spirits. Why would people worship idols? Because there are demons behind those idols that make things happen, that have power, that reveal things to people. There is a whole spiritual world we can't see. And the Bible says clearly, either you have God on the throne of your heart and you're following him, or if you're following anything else, it's in reality Satan that's manipulating you and using those systems to keep you in bondage. And he's done a pretty good job, would you not say? In fact, in, back in Psalm 115, he says, he talks about idols, and he says, those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. You see, Satan knows that what we revere, we come to resemble. That whatever those things are, they begin to control our life and begin to transform us into the objects of our focus. So what we believe changes the course of our life. And thirdly, as we talk through all of these different systems, and I'm going to talk about some different ways in which we believe, everybody can't be right. You can't say, you believe in millions of gods, you believe in one God, you believe in no God, you're all right. It's impossible. These are contradictory ideas. You can't say, life is a one-time round trip through, or one-time trip through, and then death, And there's multiple cycles of reincarnation. You come back again and again and again, try to get it right. 
Those can't both be true, can they? And in fact, even when we talk about who God is, there are so many different understandings and definitions of who is God or who are the gods, and they are completely incompatible. So the idea that says we coexist means everybody's right, listen carefully, that only works if nothing is true. If we're all making it up, then your makeup is as is good as mine. And you'll hear people, even if you try to share your faith in Christ, they will say, I'm so glad that works for you. And what's the idea? The idea is religion is really just a subjective experience of how I make sense of my world, and some people find peace and happiness here, and some people find peace and happiness here, and, and if it makes you feel better, and if it makes you a more, pers- a more moral person, then that's all wonderful. In other words, the question is no longer, is it true? The question is, does it make you feel good? And see, those are sometimes opposite questions. In fact, I would submit that a lot of sin makes you feel good for a while. And certainly the systems that enslave people can bring harmony and order and perhaps even peace to their lives. But that doesn't make them true. So as I thought about How do we examine all of these religions and how do we go through? It's clear that the majority doesn't have it right. Did you know that truth is not democratic? In America, we tend to think if you vote on it and you get 55%, 51%, then that becomes the truth. Does that make it true? No, it just makes it the accepted policy, doesn't it? And here's what Jesus said. He said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to what? Wow. He said the majority is wrong. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So Jesus said the search for truth should not be a trying to pull together all of the biggest numbers that looking for truth is actually a different thing. And we talked about worldviews. Do we figure out truth by ourselves, or has God revealed it to us? And so as we come to this question of what are the counterfeits, we need to first of all examine the genuine. You know, the Bank of England is wonderful for spotting counterfeits. And in their training program, they never allow counterfeit money. What they do is they so carefully learn the characteristics of the pound note that when you see something that doesn't match, it's a counterfeit. In fact, it it works in our culture as well. When you give a $20 bill or a $50 bill to the cashier, she pulls out a, or he pulls out a what? A pen. And they mark on it. Why? Because that mark says this is the real deal or it's not. And we've been given God's revelation Rather than one person saying, I had a vision or an idea, this book has been given, this collection of books, 40 different authors over 1,600 years. And and the amazing aspect of this holy book is that there were prophecies from hundreds of years before that were perfectly fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus could never have chosen where he was going to be born, for example. Besides that, it gives a unified and complex and beautiful picture of God communicating to us who he is. And I would ask you, would you like to have somebody watch you and guess what you're about, or would you rather tell them really what's going on inside of you? You see, God has communicated with us, and he's given us a standard by which we can judge the things to be whether true or false. This is the pen that we mark and say, is this the truth? And this is a big deal. Because your choice about what you believe, according to the scripture, determines where you spend eternity. It's the door to eternal life, and it tells us how we can follow the truth. So as I was praying about this and thinking, how do we take this incredibly complex subject, and how do we boil it down to something pretty simple? I'm going to give you five simple questions to ask that the Bible says, this is the truth, how does this match up, and does this not follow all logically and does it not cohesively fit together? So, first of all, the Bible says there's one God. Now, ironically, in our evolutionary way of thinking, 
People say, well, you know, in the beginning, people made up gods because they couldn't understand lightning and floods. And so there was a God of this mountain and a God of this stream. And, and then as they advanced more, then they developed the idea, they invented the idea of monotheism. Don't you love that? What it's saying is not that God made us in his image, but that we are creating God in our image, that we're making up gods as we want them to be. And so in the beginning of the Jewish day, they would pray through this morning prayer from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it's verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. And these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. This is the truth. It says there is one God. In Ephesians 4, 6 says one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. All the way through the scripture, the Bible says there's one God. But the Bible creates this fascinating understanding of what God is like. And the Bible says that he is a triune God. And it doesn't try to do a lot of explanation about it. That's usually what people do. It says there's one God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what we've come to be able to explain that and say that is that there are one in essence, but they are three in persons. Even one of the the original words used for God in the Hebrew is Elohim, and it's a plural word. And God, in the beginning, said, let us make man in our image. That God is this eternal fellowship with himself. And and sometimes people reject that and they say, you know, I don't really understand the Trinity, so I can't believe it. I always say, if you only believe in what you understand, that really limits your field. Because there's a whole lot of things you don't understand. How do you explain how you flip a light switch and the light comes on because of water running over a dam somewhere? I don't know, but it works. You see, this picture of God, to me, is so clearly from God because it's not what we invent ourselves. I don't know how much you've read in other religious literature, but so many religions have a a man God and a woman God, and they have spirit children, or they, they have many wives, or they have, but they're just like big people. They're like powerful, crazy people who are doing what they want to do. And it's like the Greek gods and the Roman gods and the Hindu gods, and there's all these different pictures, but they sound exactly like what people would make up. And when you talk about the Trinity, it's like the idea of an infinity. It kind of is above our pay grade. And to me, that also clearly says, this is what God has said to us about himself, not what we've tried to make up out of our understanding. So the Bible says there's one God. So therefore, any religious system that says there are multiple gods and there are no gods have to be wrong. That when you get the straight edge of God's, these simple truths, then you have to go, okay, if that's true, then everything else is wrong. And it has no, we, we, we don't feel differently about those people that are caught in a system that believes differently. We just realize What Romans 1 said is that when people reject the truth, God sends them strong delusion and they believe lies. And it isn't something we go like, they're believing lies. It's like there should be a sadness of our heart that says they're caught because they've been taught lies. Secondly, the Bible says there's only one life. That we get this one chance at a short life. And the Bible all the way through talks about how it's like a a flower of the field, it fades quickly. And, you know, the older you get, the shorter life seems, right? You're thinking when you're 20, somebody told me last night, they said, you're having a birthday. Are you going to be 45? I said, you're my new best friend, you know? (laughs) At least 45. When I told her how old I was, she was like, it doesn't really make any difference. You know, little kids, these are just numbers. But when you get older, you start realizing, man, this was quick, wasn't it? And what Bible, the Bible says is you have one round through this life, and then look at this, as people are destined to die and after that to face judgment. All the way through the scriptures, it says you have this one short life, and in this short life, 
you will make the choice or the choices that lead either to eternal life or to eternal death. That it's a big deal. And ironically, there is the Indian system of thinking. Many, many religions teach reincarnation. The idea that you live once and then this thing called karma bites you and you, for evil things you've done, you go back a stage and now you become an animal or you do well and you, you get to move to a next higher plane of existence, whatever that is. And I read an interesting observation. William Carey went to India in 1793 as a missionary to tell people about the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. A hundred years later, there was an Indian guy named Vivekanta, and he came to, the, to the New York to start a society teaching reincarnation. And, and the observation was that Carey taught Jesus was the one that made a sacrifice for our sins. Reincarnation is that you must pay for your own sins. And you may take you a hundred lifetimes to do it, but you will eventually pay. You have to work your own atonement out. That's a scary thought, isn't it? So there's one life, and it says that after that we will face the judgment. Third core teaching of all of the scriptures is that there is a core problem. And the core problem is not just a vague sense of evil. The core problem is not that we have too much desire, as Buddhism teaches, that the problem with the world is we desire things and we don't get them, so we suffer. So the answer is to quit desiring anything. So the core problem, what does the Bible say the core problem is? Sin. It says not only did we rebel against God in the beginning and not want to be under his control and under his kingship, but that each one of us have rebelled and we've chosen to do what we know to be wrong and that because of that, we are separated from a holy God and that our sin has divided us from God and you are not as bad as you could be, but you are so bad you're impossible to save yourself. And the Bible all the way goes through this sin problem that we have and even God's chosen people who who were set aside for him they kept following other gods and disobeying and and the, the story of the Bible is how God has done so many different things with people and at the end people tend to go their own way and do what they want to do instead of responding to God so because there is one core problem there is one extreme solution If you were to hear the story of the gospel for the first time, you would think it was so fantastical as to be hard to believe. That God, the three in one, that Jesus came down to become fully God and fully man so he could experience human life. And because he lived a sinless life and gave himself as the the spotless lamb, as a sacrifice for our sin, he died and he paid the price that sin required. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid that price. And then, as we talked about two weeks ago, he rose from the dead, showing that everything he had said was true. You see, that's the focal point of human history. Either that is the most awesome extension of God's love to us that you have ever heard, and the only solution to the cancer that is sin within us, or... It's just another religious myth. It's either all or it's nothing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if if Christ didn't raise from the dead, then we're all in our sins and everything we believe is ridiculous. You see, it's an all or nothing. And if it was sufficient for us, because you see, this is one of the beautiful things. Religion, if you look at all the religions of the world, they're essentially a system of works. How do I do more good things and fewer bad things so I can somehow improve my religious stake, whatever that is? And they define good things and bad things differently. They define how it's to be done differently. But that's the core essence, is that the harder you try, the better you are, the more likely you are to go to nirvana or to go to heaven or whatever that story is. Somebody said this week, and I thought this was powerful, Christianity is also a religion of works. It's the works of Jesus. It's not saying I can save myself or I can slowly better myself 
in this lifetime or in many lifetimes. It's saying there's no hope for you except that you accept the sacrifice of Jesus as a payment for your sins and a bridge that opens the way for you to have relationship with the God of the universe. That's either the most incredible truth you have ever heard or it's just another religious myth. And you see, if it was okay just to meditate or it was okay just to try to help people or okay not to eat meat, if that could make you holy enough, then why would Jesus have had to die? You see, you don't use an extreme solution for a mild problem. An extreme solution is because there's an extreme problem. And Jesus said, I am one of the many ways. No, I have a Mormon friend. She said lots of people poked fun at her belief and her religion growing up, and that had no impact on her. And she said, but somebody showed her the scripture that says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And she said, then they asked me, are you trusting Jesus for your relationship or are you trusting Joseph Smith or the church or other people? And she said that question just burned within her. Why? Because God's word is powerful, isn't it? And you see, people don't mind if we believe in God. They don't mind if you believe in Jesus. But if you say Jesus is the only way and there's no way to get to the Father except through him, ooh, you're not being very tolerant. And I want to be exactly as tolerant as Jesus. That's the last thing in the scripture. I want you to get this. He says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Do you think the multiplicity of religious beliefs is a new thing? Do you realize that one of the major emphases of the New Testament, which was written 30 to 70 years after Jesus went back to heaven, do you realize that one of the major focuses of almost all of the books Paul wrote was the false teachers and the false beliefs and the wrong ways we're getting off track? And see, this has always been the problem, is that there is truth and there is error. And the scripture says there is one book. It's actually 66 books, but it has been put together by God to communicate what he's like and what his plan is. And you say, well, well what about the latest prophet? You see, there are many, many religions that say, Moses was great, and Jesus was great, but then there's Muhammad, 600 years after Jesus. Oh, but then 1,400 years later, then there's this guy named, this guru uh, Nanak, which began the, the Sikh religion. And then in the 1800s, there was Baha'u'llah, who got a vision from God, and he founded the Baha'i faith. And then in the early 1900s, there's a Joseph Smith, and he got another word from God. And, and what about... David Koresh and the Branch Davidian, or maybe more close to home, what about Sanjit, Sant Bajit Singh, who is the guru of what was first known as the Kirpal Light Satsang? Now you just know it as the Lighthouse Bakery. You see, there are holy and religious teachers that are always saying, This is the truth, this is the truth, this is the truth. I had this vision. And you know what Paul says? He puts it very succinctly. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Now, is that tolerance? No, he's saying, I tell you, this is the truth, and any deviation from it is error. It doesn't take much of a lie to mix with the truth to get you way off track. You see, people don't have to be completely wrong. They can just be a little off. And God says, this is the straight edge. There is a narrow gate. There is a narrow way. And let me challenge you to find that, not to try to make the way as broad as possible. So you think through these simple ideas of all of the religious systems and all of the teachings of the world. And you say, do they talk about the true God? What is he like? Do they talk about the life that we have lived here and, and the purpose of that and the, the finality of that? Do they talk about the core problem of sin and how that has infested mankind? Do they talk about Jesus as the only solution. This is the only good news. Do they talk about the fact that God has given his word? And, and by the way, if you do some, some study on how we got the Bible, you'll be amazed to know how incredibly close to exactly what the authors wrote down we have today. 
People like to use this, well, it's been changed over and over in the years, and it just shows that they know nothing about how we got the book that we got. Because if we have a revealed life, then you and I need to submit ourselves to the Bible and say, what this says is true, and this is what I believe, and anything else that contradicts it, I reject, and anything that's added to it, it's like, well, who knows? I had a guy tell me, I love Jesus and I believe the Bible, but I still believe in pre-existence. That spirits were in heaven before they came to earth because that was a part of his former religious life. It's like, no, don't hang on to other things. Say, if it's here, it's true. If it gets added on, then it probably isn't. If it contradicts it, then it absolutely isn't. So I, I told you at the beginning that we would ask also the question, what religious system of belief is most dangerous to you and me today? And it may surprise you. Some of you might think, well, Islam is conquering the world and they're beheading people and it's awful. Or, or maybe the, the Eastern mysticism that slipped into our culture. You know, you know, I'll tell you the most dangerous religion, the most dangerous temptation we have in the spiritual sense is selfism. You see, if we do not put Christ as the Lord of our life, then who is most likely to sit on the throne of your heart? Me. Somebody who doesn't go to church here anymore, and they're going to another church, and she was trying to tell me what it was a good idea, and she said, well, it's really small, so it's comfortable for us. Okay? And they have lots of food there. That's how I'd choose my church. Oh, and we have lots of Bible. But you know what I was hearing through that? I was hearing that even though I say I'm a follower of Jesus, what I really want is for it to be all about me. And let me say this clearly. If you're a follower of Jesus, it means you submit your life to his control and you become a born-again follower of Jesus. And it means you're being transformed in your lifestyle so that you are letting God change you from the inside out to become a new person that becomes more and more and more like Jesus. And then it means that you're on mission with Jesus and your life is not about how to make me comfortable and how to do what I want and how to get everything to go my way. My life is about the kingdom of God and submitting myself so that I am the hands and feet of Jesus to the people that I see in my neighborhood. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And there are many people who say, I'm a Christian, but they really are worshiping themselves and they believe in a certain system of Christianity that makes it convenient for them to feel comfortable, but they're not on mission with Jesus. And there's a world of difference. And unfortunately, even groups of people that go to church, I think there are lots of people who have gotten into a religious system of doing good things and being involved in Christian activities But if you say, do you love Jesus with all your heart and soul? Are you being transformed from the inside out with the sin that still grips us? Are you on mission with Jesus? Is the purpose of your life to see the kingdom of God extended? You say, well, no, no, that sounds like pastors and missionaries and crazy people. No, that sounds like people who are genuinely disciples of Jesus. So I would challenge you to examine not whether you're falling into some false religious system, but whether you are sliding back into the worship of self, which is our first default setting. Because I think that's our greatest danger. Let me ask you a couple questions, but first I'm going to release to Green, and Pastor Craig is going to walk with you through these questions down there. What do you really believe? Would you write the word what there beside it? Not do you believe, I know you believe something, but do you believe what the Bible teaches? Have you studied that? Are you clear? Does it grip you? Because the second question is, how does it impact your life? And and let me give you a sneaky Bible quiz. Here's a Bible quiz for the day. What are your neighbor's names? And even more importantly, what is their spiritual condition? You see, because when we get to know the Bible and we get to know Jesus, it makes us, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second commandment is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. 
And if we are going to make a difference in this world, it's not going to be because we hold a big campaign. It's going to be because people who are followers of Jesus permeate their clubs and their schools and their neighborhoods and their families, and they experience the life of Jesus and they express the love of Jesus. And people go, I don't know what you got, but I want some of that. And that's what God's called us to do. And that's what he wants to do in us and through us. Father, thank you for the truth. That it's not arrogant to say this is the truth. What's, it's, it's wonderful to say gratefully, God, that you've communicated to us and you've led us through all of the bramble bushes of all the possible beliefs. And, and somehow we've been privileged to be given the truth. And God, may it not make us arrogant, may it make us grateful. And may it stir us up so that we desire to see you more and more exercised in our life than the way we treat our neighbors and the way that we are able to talk with people who disagree and who maybe see the world very differently and love them and understand them and express to them the love of Jesus. And I pray for my friend JJ and for his kids and grandkids that at some point they might see that Jesus is more than just a prophet, that he is the Savior of the world. Help us, God, to have confidence in our belief and comfortability in our expression of that belief to others. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.